Good morning. It's uh, June 11th today, and we're in 1 Kings 8, and this is, I think, one of the most important chapters in Scripture. It's Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple, and there's so much about it that it shows, um, I think, how to pray, for one thing. It talks, uh, it shows us how we should uh, talk to God and approach Him. It's one of the longest prayers in Scripture as well, but um, there's something I think that is uh, really uh, important in here, is that it um, kind of talks about Israel's upcoming future, and uh, um, Solomon certainly sees the way that this is all going to go. He knows the human heart. He knows the history of Israel. And he sees that there's going to come a day when they're going to need repentance, when they're actually even going to be driven out of the land, and they're going to um, pray to the Lord to bring them back. Um, but he also includes this little paragraph beginning in verse 41. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your own people Israel, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. And so this was supposed to be a place of a testimony for Israel to the nations around, and that God was supposed to be accessible to those nations as well. And we see that Solomon built a large courtyard around his uh, temple for access for the Gentiles there, and that would be the case for Herod's temple as well. Um, and of course, we know when Jesus cleanses that temple that he's actually taking people out of the court of the Gentiles because they're making it so crowded that Gentiles can't even have access there. Um, but I think it's important to understand that this has always been God's plan, that he has been um, accessible to all peoples, that his desire is to be known and worshipped by people from every tribe and tongue and nation from all over the world. And so I like that um, little inclusion in here as well. But look at verse um, 46 a little bit further down. When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and give them over to their enemies who take them captive to their own lands, far away or near. And if they have a change of heart in the land where they are held captive, he's talking about Israel, and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors and say, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly. And if they turn back to you with all their heart and soul in the land of their, their, their enemies who... Uh, took them captive, and pray to you toward the land you gave their ancestors, toward the city you have chosen, and the temple I have built for your name. Then from heaven your dwelling place, hear their prayer and their plea, and uphold their cause, and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Forgive all offenses they have committed against you, and cause their captors, captors to show them mercy. For they are your people and your inheritance, whom you brought out of Egypt, out of that iron-smelting furnace. So he's looking down into the distant future and seeing the exile, seeing the pleas for the people from exile, people like Daniel, uh, and then um, asking God to hear and to bring them back, uh, even after they've been um, removed for their sin. So uh, I think it's important for us to understand that God predicted this, that Solomon even saw it and talked about it in Scripture well before it happened, so that his people would be prepared for it. That's it.